This series is a GRDC investment that takes you behind the scenes as we sit down with some of the people shaping our grain industry, uncovering their journeys, learning more about their passions and the projects that are part of their everyday. We are over in Western Australia. This is now the third part of what has been the GRDC In Conversation podcast. We've covered Southern Australia. We've covered the North across New South Wales and Queensland. And now we've headed West to meet with all sorts of growers, advisors, researchers, and people involved in the Aussie grains industry. Welcome to the next series. When I was reading the different buyers of people, and obviously I only had names on a page, and I saw Seat of Light Award winner, and I've already talked to a few. And then when I started to do a bit more research, I go, geez, he's a bit young. So, <laughs> <laughs> I do you want to start there? Obviously, a compliment. And then- I'm feeling pretty old, Ollie. I have to tell you. Like, oh, this time of year, yeah, absolutely. It's flat out. Well, this time of year, it makes sense because you spent no time at home. So, it's good to be able to track you down and be in your hometown of Perth. Thanks, yeah. Mate, um, GRDC in conversations, we, you're our first chat over in the West. So, as someone from the East Coast who's travelled here a couple of times, talk to me about the ag space over here and what do I need to know to feel up to speed this week? Oh, yeah. Well, you probably do need to get up to speed. Most, um, I reckon most WA growers, they push the barrier pretty hard. Like, they'll adopt technology pretty early. They'll give things a go. They'll look for solutions. They'll source research where they need to. So, they're pretty proactive in terms of getting their head around what they need to do to improve the bottom line in their business. And I ask a lot of questions, which is good for, you know, a research engineer like myself. I get asked a lot of questions about a whole lot of stuff, and that's probably because we cover a lot of topics. But, yeah, the egg space here is good. It's positive. It's quite embracing. People will give you their spray at a test or they'll actively go out of their way to make stuff happen that helps you do your job. So talk to me a little bit. You're a research engineer. What does that actually look like what's a week in your life look like so at the moment it's, it's pretty busy but i'm an agricultural engineer there was only six graduates when i went through usq in toowoomba for that year so most of us have stayed in ag some have sort of drifted into other things typically uh, we do a lot of research and extension work so we'll actually go and get the data collect the data figure out a test protocol if we need to apply an australian standard whatever it might be to get some data and some numbers around whatever the topic we're looking at and then we actually need to kind of translate that. And so the communication part kicks in and we'll extend that information. So, you know, this month's pretty pretty hectic. We've got a lot of GRDC grain harvester set up workshops on around the country. We've got a lot of grain storage workshops on as well. And then we've got some self-propelled spray testing work going on with Condon Group. So it's a bit of a, a juggling act at the moment. September's a really busy month. It's probably... The equivalent of my harvest, if you know what I mean, yeah. And so you were an East Coast boy originally? Yeah, so mum and dad are still farming uh, in the New England, so we're at 5,000 feet above sea level there. It's pretty bloody cold. I'm reminded every time I go home to the farm, just while I headed west, it's a lot warmer over here. Yeah, everyone says, oh, it's freezing, it's winter. And I'm like, oh, you got no idea. It's like, yeah, I've been at Ben Lomond, it's minus 16. It's, yeah, pretty, pretty chilly. So sheep over there, cattle? Sheep and cattle, yep. And then uh, I had an uncle who was based at Edgeroy and uh, I'd go there and help out with harvest and seeding, whatever was going on. So got uh, a bit of both really, yeah, which is great. And so what was it about the grains industry that's pulled you a little bit harder than the livestock? Probably um, everyone likes machinery, don't they? They like playing with the big toys. And as an engineer, it's probably a lot more happening in that space that I could sink my teeth into. So you know, we did a lot of work on harvest of fires. We did a lot of work on, you know, machinery testing. And, and you know, I started with Condon Group sort of 23 or four years ago. And, yeah, we, we were straight into testing equipment. And I suppose as an engineer, you know, I was that kid that got up at 6 o'clock and pulled alarm clocks to pieces because I wanted to see how they work. It was an easy transition. You know, we wanted to see how gear worked. We wanted to make the most out of it. We wanted to get them, you know, improve the efficiency of it. So, you know, the grains industry has plenty of that and um, a lot of opportunity, yeah. It's one skill set to be able to pull something apart, but you could put that alarm clock back together as well? Or There's probably a few of my sister's toys that didn't quite make it all the way back. Oh, yeah, if I'm truthful. But, yeah, it's the same in ag. You know, we'll, we'll pull a harvest at a bits and have a look at what's going on in there. And, you know, I've got some really great people I work with that'll – throw ideas at me as to, you know, how we might be able to optimise the performance, get the most out of it. Yeah, so there's lots going on. So what are the options? For someone who studies ag engineering and for you, what were the options in front of you when you were leaving Queensland? Well, it probably goes back a step prior to that. You know, at school, you know, the career advisor came around and they said, oh, 
you know, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, look, you know, I was pretty handy with numbers. Maths and science was something I really enjoyed. But I still wanted to work in the egg industry, you know. That's what I'd grown up. I, I had love of agriculture and it's been in our family, family for generations of farmers there. And and so she said, well, why don't you do egg engineering? I'm like, didn't even know there was such a thing. And um, I had a couple of other mates are doing engineering. So it all made sense to sort of bring that together. So, uh, yeah, I think the natural transition to ag engineering was an easy one. Went up to Toowoomba, spent four years doing that, and then got a stipend to do some work actually in the cotton industry. So did a, a field of work in water use efficiency in the cotton industry. And then Condinin Group was uh, just something that mum and dad had been members of for a while. I noticed there's a couple of ag engineers on staff, and so I was like, maybe I should do my work experience there and toddle off down to Wagga and, yeah, did a month or so down there and, yeah, sort of really got to work with the group and loved what they did and kind of been here ever since, yeah. So you came in as the coffee boy back then yeah, and you've literally stuck around? Well, literally, I got down there. We'd made arrangements to go down there and I was going to stay at the, the boss's place. He just said, oh, there's a bed out the back. You can stay here and got down to Wagga and, of course, they'd all gone out skiing that day and uh, I couldn't get a hold of anyone, so I ended up camping at the caravan park. And one of the other staff members, Cat Nichols, said, oh, this is ridiculous. You've got to come and stay at my place. So, yeah, it was great. We just sort of – I felt like I was part of a family and I think from that point forward really embraced the independence of the group and I guess getting to understand what they were there for and being a part of it was, was, it was exciting. Yeah, it's good. So that trip to Wagga, how old were you at that stage? Oh, good question. I don't know. Probably, yeah, it would have been, I don't know, 20, 21, yeah. And that was the the beginning. It was you went from there, and then like talk to me about that work experience. What were they getting you yeah, well, today? You know, as you say, you know, you get all the crappy jobs when you're the work experience kid. But they actually threw a pile of um, someone had donated some power farming magazines to the group, and they're like, "Oh, we need you to index these." I'm like, oh, "Okay, this is pretty interesting." So I'm going through, and there's like they were doing some pretty cool stuff back in the 40s and 50s. You know, working on uh, you know incorporating lime at depth, and I'm like, "Geez, here we are," you know. 70 years later, we're still talking about doing some of this stuff. That was one of the jobs. But then we got into some harvest and loss testing. So I was working with, at that stage, Dr. Graham Quick came down. He was working with a group. And there was myself, Jeff Hamilton, James Boucher. We are all out in the field on our hands and knees with little quadrants looking at how much grain was coming out the front end of a, of a stripper front at that point in time. So that was really it's great. It's hands-on. If you're going to critique a piece of gear and evaluate it, you've got to make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's. You don't want to be... I guess, wishy-washy in your approach. You've got to be certain that you know what you're saying is correct and you know, decisions will be made based on what you find. So, yeah. And so looking at it from the, I guess, the lens of being able to critique what's there and I guess ask the questions of and curiosities of why isn't it different, et cetera, how can or have you been poached by machinery companies to say, well, actually, why don't you come in-house and come and I'll say, put your money where you've been. I've had colleagues that have had to do that. Yeah, so they've, they've moved off and, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the breadth of what we do. So, you know, I, we could be testing mobile phones one month and we'll be testing sheep handles the next month and then, you know, seeding bars the following, you know. So there's a breadth to that that you're never going to get with, you know, one particular machinery company. Yep, sure, you can dig your teeth right into one bit of gear, but I probably enjoyed the variety, to be honest, yeah. Has there been one piece of research or something that you've looked at which has really been i guess close to home something that you were like okay um, this is a step change piece i do a lot of work at these harvester workshops on harvester fires and that is a little bit close to home because we had a harvester fire on the farm at edgeroy my cousin got burnt on his arms trying to put it out and i just really wanted to get my head around what the hell was going on and that same guy dr graham quick who i mentioned before we're doing the, the harvester loss work with he was really interested in the fire space as well so we work pretty closely together on that, and I think there's probably some work that's come out of that that, I don't know, hopefully we've been able to help people be more prepared, set the machine up better, be more, I guess, uh, cognizant of, of what could happen and be prepared for, you know, what, what happens if there is a harvest of fire, you know. So, yeah, it's probably been one that sort of sticks out in my mind. And then we always get asked about the mobile phone stuff, you know. It's the most popular research report that Continuum Group do. Is it every year? It normally would be annual. So, you know, we go to the middle of the hay plain. So there's one tower there that we know is the landscape around is perfectly flat. So there's no topography. We know we've got a perfect signal there. So we just go with a whole heap of handsets and we make call after call after call. And you could technically look at all the RSSI values and the, and the 
technical numbers that sit behind the signal strength, etc. But we actually make a two-way call. So there's some poor bugger at the end of the line. That cops a lot of calls that day. Huh? What? Huh? Yeah, huh? that's right. Yeah, there's a fair bit of that going on. And I suppose, you know, we just want people to have the best handset they can get. Mobile communications is really important to people. And it was back, I think, when CDMA switched across to NextG and now we're seeing that go out the door. There was a, you know, it was a big impact on a lot of farmers and we actually got called in as into federal court in Melbourne in a case between the ACCC and Telstra. Now, Josh and my colleague of 20-something years was the poor bugger on the stand and got absolutely drilled by Telstra silks, you know, not something you want to do. But what that did tell us is, or teach us, I suppose, is that we need to, as I said before, cross the T's, dot the I's, make sure you document absolutely anything and everything. And and so I think for anyone who's working that research space, that would be the one thing I'd say to them, just make sure that you are absolutely sure and you've got really good documentation because you never know when it might save you bacon. So for those playing along at home, I guess anecdotally we say services are getting worse. What have you guys actually seen as the trends there? Oh, there's a fair bit happening at the moment. There's a lot of transition. We're in a sort of in this weird space where there might be some signals that are tuned down, some that are phasing out. Obviously, that 850 meg band is going. It'll be repurposed to 5G. How that's going to perform, we don't really know. And we won't go phone testing again until everything's sort of settled down in that space. So we haven't done it. We would normally do it in April every year. And yeah, again, we always just go to Hay, set up there. We know the tower there's had some changes as well. So yeah, we'll just reval where we end up. But yeah, it's a pretty crazy process out in the <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere with a whole heap of phones. And there's one farmer who always sees us. I don't know, it's like so remote, but he always comes up. And he's like, still trying to test those phones out, eh, boys? Like, we haven't seen him for 12 months. He's a really funny guy. Yeah. How would it work? Like, say if the phone company's cottoned onto it, like, couldn't they potentially distort your figures uh yeah they could so if they gave us a handset that was tweaked somehow yeah possibly but we go and buy them all and then we sell them later on but samsung are onto it they've been phoning us up saying look we want to we, we figure we've got some issues we we need to replicate what you guys did they went and replicated it rang back and said yeah you were right actually so we're going to make some changes to some of the firmware which is cool it's nice to know that you can i guess influence things and make them better for the end user and and the end user in our case is, is farmers around the country. I guess we're a little bit like Choice Magazine in that respect, but for farmers, yeah. And I think like it's so important because it's like what you guys are covering. It's not just the day to day business efficiencies. It's not just checking in on family members. It can be at cases of when things go wrong and it becomes life or death or yeah, at, at points of when there's fires and you need people to be able to access the information as quickly and effectively as they can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. So there's one part of it's efficiency and making sure that piece of equipment that we've got is, is operating at peak efficiency, but there's also safety. And we operate in an industry that's inherently dangerous. We operate big gear. In a lot of cases, there's not that safety training we probably should have or other industries might have. So I guess making sure that we can make it as safe as possible is important. And if that's just straight communications, well, that's a good start, you know, being able to get the message out, call for help, whatever you need to do, yeah. So one more question, maybe just on some of the topics and things you cover. Like there is so much that you could talk about in ag and at different times it feels like this is, yeah, number one priority versus that. Like how do you actually decide what you're talking about and when and how do you yeah, choose those topics? Yeah, so the GRDC stored grain work that I do, so grain storage, that's ongoing. That's always um, on the table and I will answer my phone at any stage for anyone who wants to talk about that. So that's a given. Harvest the workshops are on at the moment – they're always around this time of year, so we're around the country sort of pre-harvest, trying to get people up to speed with what they need to think about. And then the content and group research work, that'll be on whatever topic it might be at the time. So there's a list that gets generated from a survey that's sent out to, well, actually it's all farmers around the country we can get our hands on. So we get about 450 responses from them and we sit down and actually go through the top three items that are on their, you know, effective in their business. And then we ask them also, what are the top three, three pieces of machinery you want us to look at? So we sit down and distill that. Number one, always in the, what are the three factors influencing your farm business? Rain, just send us more rain. You know, it's like, oh, come on guys. You gotta be a bit more inventive than that. But yeah, it does. It's things like succession planning have really evolved as a big issue on farm. And that's something that I think we've put a couple of reports out on that. It's pretty varied, I suppose, in terms of where we might go with that. But again, you know, people love machinery. They love high horsepower, harvesters, sprayers, tractors, whatever it might be. 
toys. They love those big toys because they are an important part of their business, but they're also a bloody huge part of the investment they've got on farm as well. So getting the most out of them is essential. And it's only getting more and more too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I went to the CR11 launch here in Perth the other day and we're talking about, you know, most harvesters now start with a one and I saw some quotes come through, you know, for that particular machine, you know, optioned right up with everything that was started with a two. You know, that's a lot of money to be tied up in a machine that might be operating for six to eight weeks a year. Yeah. Talk to me. One thing that was, so I did a little bit of background research on you and I talked to a couple of people. They said if there was something that they really credit you for, it's being able to grab that research, but actually being able to talk about it in terms that people can understand and that you're as good as anyone else at, I guess, the extension side of it. That's that's very kind. Look, I think there's some great research that's done in Australia and I think we've got people who spend a lot of time and a lot of effort getting data and gathering numbers and I guess, you know, going down into minute detail, being able to put that into practice for me is what's important. So what can you do practically on farm that is going to – like improve what you do, it's going to make you more profitable. We'll talk about economic sustainability on a farm. Is That's got to be first and foremost because otherwise a farm doesn't exist, right? We've got to make sure that people are economically able to keep that farm going so they can concentrate on the other aspects of sustainability that are absolutely important. So making sure that they can apply their research is essential. And like I said, the research is great. It's out there. I think where we can find ways that they can apply it and yeah, I'm one for just dumbing stuff down. You know, I kind of need to do it for myself. So I'll read a scientific paper and then just like write a dozen notes as to or key points that we can apply on farm. And like I say, you know, again, trying to bring it back to that practical, what can be applied on farm and how can it make a difference and how much of a difference is it going to make? Then we'll talk about what the compromises might be. So if you were chatting to someone who's, I'll say, in their 20s, not long out of uni and starting to look at those early job opportunities, if someone and, and- – In ag, extension is a huge opportunity, as you say, grab all that research to actually like make the tangible impact on the ground. What would be your advice to people? How could I get better at being a good extender of knowledge to farmers? Uh, You do a lot of listening. I think you also do in in your current role. So, you know, you're absorbing a lot of information. I think that's it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're pulling all these bits and pieces of information together and then the other parts of the puzzle come from the growers. So you've got to listen to a lot of people and be able to join those things together. Find out where the needs are, you know. It's like, a, you know, if, if we're talking about machinery that costs a bomb, well, A, how can we either get it cheaper? Well, that's pretty hard to do. How can we make it better? How can we get more efficiency out of it? That's the, where the two pieces come together. Is there one topic or one piece of machinery, if you could do anything that you'd really want to jump into and do? Look, I, I just think that, you know, and it's probably front of mind, but the, you know, the harvesting side of things at the moment, the big dollars, I, you know, I've been out testing with guys like Brett Asfar, Rod Gribble. You know, we know that we can put bits and pieces inside those machines that will improve them in their operation in Australian conditions. We operate in some pretty crazy conditions for harvesting. You know, and like most other places in the world, they're trying to battle snow and not whatnot. We're out there bashing around in huge amounts of heat and dry, dusty conditions. So we have different requirements, and we're using the same machine out of the box, but expecting it to do, you know, work miracles. So that's probably one where I think we can actually extract a lot of benefit. And look, the, the grain storage side of things, just make sure people buy the right silos. It's one thing to harvest it and bring it in, but buying up front right in the first place is an absolute requirement when it comes to grain storage. And I'm glad you talk about that because for me, I'd say I kind of look at a, a silo as a silo, but a silo is not a silo. Oh, no, no. Well, if you think about the value of grain you've got inside that thing, you know, it can be huge. You know, if you've got uh, chickpeas in it at the moment or what, a thousand bucks a tonne, you're a silo full of chickies and they're, you know, discolouring and getting downgraded. And all you needed to do was push some cool, dry air through it to maintain colour. And there's some research that shows that that's entirely, you know, possible. You know, let's do that. And, We've worked so hard to get the crop to that stage and it's probably arguably the one time where we've got some control over the environment that that crop is in. So we haven't got to – we can't do much about it when it's in the paddock, but once we've harvested and brought it in put it in a silo, we can actually do something about the climate. We can push some air through it and we can – if it's a gas-tight soluble soil, we can fume it and eradicate the insects in there. So there's a – well, we've got to have the right tools really only to do that, yeah. I do want to ask you, and I'm glad you brought that up, you were the man at the end of the, was it 1-800-Weevil yeah. <laughs> hotline. 
Now, tell me, was there a jingle or something that you came up for it? So, we were talking about this last week. This is a Friday afternoon, couple of beers, and and Chris Warwick, who heads up the project, and he's a really good mate of mine, and we probably talk most days. And he was working with Condina Group with me at the time, and in Toowoomba, and we'd sit at the back and have a couple of beers, and I was like, you know, we just need a national hotline, you know, like like a 1-800 you know, number of some sort, and I'm like, it's got to have six digits after it. And I'm like, what about 1-800 Weevil? I'll go and have a look. So I'm on there and I'm like, well, it's not taken. Maybe we should just register, you know. But, of course, it had to go up for auction because, you know, all those 1-800 numbers go up for auction. So we're sort of sitting there and it was due to be auctioned, I don't know, two weeks later, and we got the number. And it's kind of been there ever since. So in WA, that will come straight to me. In South Australia, that number will come to me. Well, we've geo sort of geo-directed it. So if it's in uh, Victoria, it'll go to Chris. And if it's in the northern region, it'll go to Alex there. Because, you yeah, know, if it was just me handling all the calls, yeah, A, you know, would you good in calls at all times of the day and night. But, yeah, it's good. I think people do use it. And um, we get a lot of calls around pre-harvest and a lot of calls at seeding time when people crack their eyes open and find a whole heap of insects in there that they didn't know they had. And we'll have a chat about how we can do that better next year. And, yeah, to me, that's... Yeah, it's a great thing and everyone remembers the number, which is awesome. So, yeah. Is it more of a knowledge hub line or is it more of a like emergency, oh, crap? Oh, no. no, It's a knowledge hub. So, you know, I'd rather people, you know, before they invest a heap of money in in a grain storage facility that they give us a call on that number. We can sort of talk them through some of the considerations. Think about where your power is. Think about your drainage. Think about lighting. Think about the layout. Think about doing it in stages so that you might say, oh, I'm going to put these, I can afford to invest CapEx in this sort of storage this year. But I also need to think about what I'm going to do you know, in three years' time. So kind of planning, I suppose. You're planning the investment, yeah. But we do get the emergency call where people are like, I've just cracked open a grain bag and it's full of insects, what can I do? You know, so then we sort of step through the process of, well, do you have you know, gas tight saleable storage? Right, well, you need to transfer the grain to that fumet according to the label and make sure you can outload it and not get pinged for anything that, you know, excess fuming into whatever might be in the grain. So we're just trying to step them through that process, get them out of a, a hole, yeah. Question on grain storage. Grain bags, are they becoming more and more common? And let's ask you your opinion on them too. Yeah, grain bags get used. They're, they're a good short-term option. They're great for logistics. There's plenty of them get used, particularly in the southern part. There's a couple of growers down Esperance Way that that's all they rely on because it keeps their machine running and they can then outload later on. But they're a short-term option, so you don't want to sort of go any further than sort of four months otherwise – birds, foxes chasing mice across them, all that sort of stuff, they tear them up and, of course, then you get a lot of spoilage. So good short, short-term short option, got to be done well, got to be prepared, site's got to be nice and flat and, well, sorry, on a slight grade, but you don't want it to be on a, a really steep slope. Don't put it in a table, drain a couple of guys in South Australia, rang me last year and said, I did what you said and I put it beside the road, but it's in a table drain and now it's half full of water. It's like, oh, man, yeah, it's hard. And make sure you get that tractor steering straight. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you need, need to get it straight. Nothing worse than seeing like a big S. And typically the one near the road, right, that everyone drives past. And like, oh, didn't do that too well, did they? You know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The judgment. Um, I, I want to ask you about, I guess, so we talked a little bit about the continent side, mm. the other side of the work you do as a consultant. Talk to me about coming together and the early opportunity that came up with, I guess, uncommon kind of collaboration with some knowledgeable people and yeah. and yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So that industry work that we do, I mean, it's an opportunity that popped up. You know, it was driven by GRDC to their credit. And I don't know who was at the helm at the time, but they probably saw a bunch of young guys who were keen, enthusiastic, wanting to have a crack with half a clue on grain storage. Like, I, I, you know, we'd written a book about it at that stage, so we had a reasonable idea of what we we're talking about. And then we had another group of, you know, I, I guess they were probably the custodians of grain storage uh, knowledge. And they'd been there for a long time. They'd done some work with various, you know, CSRO, with GRDC, all that sort of stuff. And, yeah, GRDC just sort of, I guess, said, well, no, neither of you got it independently, but we want you guys to sit down and have a chat. And I'm pretty sure they were, well, no, because they told us afterwards. They're like, you know, we just thought, who are these bloody young punks, you know, they're rocking up, thinking they know everything about grain storage. Quite the opposite, you know. The collaboration worked beautifully and combining their experience and knowledge with our probably enthusiasm and and probably a different approach of to communications worked fantastically well and they're lifelong friends you know like pete botter who we worked with we've lost him now but he came to him a wedding and you know like great people great people yeah yeah what did you learn about i guess coming in probably obviously with 
credibility and a track record, but actually then coming in and was there moments of humbling from- Oh, God. And this, yeah, absolutely. And there still is. So, we've got a little WhatsApp group. Those you know, guys like Philip Burrell, who is another Cedar Light winner, his knowledge on grain storage and entomology is hard to surpass. I can't think of anyone else who would know more about the practical application on farm than Phil. You know, he's still on our WhatsApp group and he quite regularly sends us little notes saying, oh, I found this, guys. You know, you might find this bit of, you know, information useful and we'll still throw questions at him. Hey, Phil, when you did that research, you know, all those years ago, what did you find? So, yeah, we've been, in my whole career, I've been super lucky to work with mentors that have provided me with huge amounts of patience in terms of putting up with lots of questions and we ask a lot of questions, you know, like I want to know. That's the thing. Bill Ryan, who worked at Condon Group, I was there as well, you know, He's a research scientist, specialised in meats, of all things, so long distance from engineering. Scientific rigour is one of the things that he taught us to really get our heads around. And so they taught us a lot, you know. That experience and wisdom and knowledge is something that we've benefited, benefited from greatly. Yeah, it's important. So you've done some extraordinary work and been able to hang your hat on different areas. Like what what is there still ahead for you? Like what are the things that are really exciting you or what are the, some of the challenges that you'd love to really sink your self into i love getting uh i don't love it at the time but then in hindsight i do it, it's funny we just had did some work on mouse bait spreading and and we got a call late in the season last year and it was to do with lodging you know how does mouse bait lodge in cr- three different crops of different you know um yields you know so really heavy crop really light crop and we need it done in like three or four weeks and i was like oh wow we're gonna figure this out and i was be- i'd been lucky enough to do some work with steve henry from csro who worked on the mouse side of things he told me about this fluorescent dye they'd used on the mice, you know, just to work out where they were getting around from their burrow at night. And he'd also then used that on some wheat seed to emulate bait. And I thought we could do that, you know. So three weeks out from this crop being harvested, we've made this fluorescent glow in the dark bait, gone and spread it. And then we're out, you know, Josh and I are out there at midnight with, you know, black lights and we're <laughs> shining around trying to find this glow in the dark bait. It's, it's ridiculous. It kind of looked like something out of Star Wars. But those challenges to me, are they're great. And they'll just pop up. So we panic a little bit at the time. We're trying to get our heads around whatever else has been done. But in a lot of cases, you know, it'll be reasonably unique. No one will have done it before. So trying to find a solution as to how to test it and for that to a level where it could be peer reviewed ultimately, you know, it has to stand up and be irrefutable. It's It's got to be, yeah, bang on. So to do that, will be something I'm going to continue to do. And I think the harvesting space, as I said before, all that post-harvest work is something that I really enjoy. So, yeah, more of that. Yeah. A question, like it's more, I guess, just from a general interest. So for someone who's so busy and when it comes to something thrown in at you like that, how do you actually manage your capacity and your ability to show up and be able to do it for 20 plus years? Yeah. They always say that like a farmer is always backed up by someone at home. You know, if you're out in the tractor you're doing all this stuff, you're flat out all the day. There's always someone at home, and my family are incredibly accommodating. My wife, Verity, she, you know, we've got three kids. We've got a 12-week-old at home, you know. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. So um, they are just amazing. I couldn't do what I do without their support, and that extends, you know, Verity's family. We've got a, a farm at Darren, you know. I'll ring Andrew up and I'll say, oh, mate, I need some wheat seed. Yep, it's in the shed. Just go and grab it. Or I need to come and do this or need to do that. Or can we you know, test this or that, and, you know, they're super accommodating. So I'm blessed to have a family that allow me to do what I do, yeah. What's your favourite part of working in agriculture? Oh, just the people are amazing, aren't they? You know, you're in the same boat. Ollie, you know, we work with some incredible people. They're so generous. I mean, with their time, with their equipment, with their farm, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, the, the mouse boating work that we've been doing, we want to just borrow your SP so we can mount it really high, do this lodging work that we're doing. Yeah, no worries. When do you want to do it? Oh, oh, I don't know. Later in the week? Yeah, fine. No worries. You know, so we just rock up, attach some gear to the back of their SP sprayer or we want to borrow a sprayer for boom stability testing. We work in an industry, I think, where people are, are generous with their time, with their equipment, and they genuinely appreciate what you do for them. And I think, for me, that's the rewarding part of what we do. You know, they're, they're appreciative. Yeah. Kind of like the agriculture version of like a, a top gear or something really, aren't you? We have talked about this a bit. So one of the things that we do every couple of years is we go to this massive ag show in Germany called Agritechnica. So Mark, Josh and myself go there. Mark's a machinery specialist. He knows everything there is to know about machinery and who's who in the zoo in terms of 
what's coming out next. He's the editor of Farming Head magazine now, and I handed the reins over to him a few years ago, and he's a great guy, does a lot of research with us. And Mark, Josh, and I go off to Agritechnica, and we're there, and we'll um, go through all these stands of equipment and have a look at new stuff that's coming out. It's kind of mind-blowing, you know? And so at one stage, we did talk about, you know, we're in Germany, and maybe we go to, you know, somewhere where we can do some, you know, high-speed tractor driving around a, <laughs> a racetrack or something. Yeah, so that was kind of thrown around. And, yeah, but, look, I, you know, Jeremy Clarkson's done a pretty darn good job in the farming space for us in any case, yeah. so Absolutely, yeah. Now, one final question. We need to talk about the Cedar Lada Award. I think we'll come full circle. What does it mean to be recognised? Initially, I was a little bit embarrassed, to be honest, Ollie, because I think there's people who have done way more than I have, but, I think in hindsight, I think it demonstrates what I was able to do because of the people who mentored me. So really that award was for all the people who had mentored me to that spot, you know, people like Bill Ryan who who really, you know, drilled into us the, the importance of scientific rigour. You know, people I work with, you know, Josh Jamelli with the Chris Warwick's of this world, Mark Saunders, you know, they're, they're guys that are, have really, I suppose, got me to where I've gotten to. And so that award was as much for them as it was for me. So, yeah, it was amazing to receive it. And, yeah, they're a beautiful. I don't know if you've seen the, the actual award itself, but it's a glass. It's beautifully made. I think Maureen Cribb, who's uh, been at GRDC forever and a day, has some hand in getting those made. But they're made by a glass artist in Canberra somewhere, and they're just, yeah, they're an incredible piece of art, yeah. So it holds a very significant place in the house? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's important. And I, I think I'm humbled. To, to have received it, yeah. But I feel, still feel like I've got a fair bit more to give to, so, yeah. Absolutely, you do. <laughs> no, well, Ben, thank you so much for having a chat with us. I think I've enjoyed the morning and make sure you stay safe out there while you're driving around and big few weeks coming up for your harvest. Yeah, thanks yeah, thanks very much, Ollie. And you too, so safe travels and uh, thanks for the chat. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Thanks for joining us for the GRDC In Conversation podcast. This series is a GRDC investment that's sharing the stories of the people who are living and breathing the Aussie grains industry. Make sure you check out some of our other conversations and hit follow on your favourite podcast app to never miss an episode.